Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let us meet once again as we share the word of God together. And uh, let us meet with our God, whose spirit is with us now and throughout our day lives. Let us pray for opportunities to share the blessings we receive, for God to provide the ways with which we might speak them and inspire actions through which we might share them, that all might be drawn to the God we save. Let us pray. To you, our God, we lift our hearts. How great you are. You are our Savior, you are our power, you are our strength, you are the giver of life, giving water to quench our spiritual thirst. You are boisterous, one beyond our imagining. You are the giver of gifts beyond compare. To you, O oh God, we lift our heart, we raise our eyes, and we shout in adoration. May the good Lord be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this morning, um, I'll ask my brother, Benny, to come and read the word of God, which comes from the book of Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Brother Ben, it's in your, hour, your time to come over and read the word of God. God bless and what a wonderful day it is today. Uh, a bit warm here on the tablelands, but um, yeah, it's really great. I uh, just uh, feel so lucky to be able to read the Word of God and also to uh, be here with Johnson and hearing his message and uh, yeah, just being able to glean from him and uh, take from what he says so I say we should just say a quick prayer for Johnson before before I read so Lord I just thank you so much for Johnson uh, bless him Lord help him to continue to uh, produce powerful sermons and um, yeah we just put him in your hands and just thank you so much for him we're so blessed in Jesus name Amen, amen. so Luke 3 uh, verses 7 to 16 7 to 17. <laughs> John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Do not exhort money, extort money, and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I will baptise you with water, but one is coming more powerful than I powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in the hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord for this week. Praise God. Uh, we'll get Johnson back and um, yeah, bring open ears. Thanks, Johnson. I am I'm now lighting the third candle for the Advent. And uh, I will be praying as 
I'm lighting this third candle of Advent, which shows who God is to us. As we light this Advent candle, Father, we want to thank you. May this flame be for a sign of the light that reveals to us our path through life, that inspires us to live simple and generously for the example and call of John the Baptist, that we ourselves may be the signs of good news we proclaim. And we want to thank everyone who is participating and following these services, that they be blessed through your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this morning I've decided to share with you on a theme, proof by the way you live that you have repented. Prove by the way you live that you have repented. John the Baptist tells us in our gospel for today, produce fruit that shows have changed your hearts and lives. That word produce is a radical clue. It's not enough for a disciple of Jesus to claim to be different. You don't claim to be different. You don't tell people that, can you see I'm different? People should see for themselves that you are different. It's not enough for a disciple of Jesus to claim to be different. The only way to tell what lies in a man or a woman's heart is to see them act differently. So the proof is in the pudding. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, so to speak. Our face of the world reveals what lies within our hearts. What is it that lies within our hearts? Now, we, we are not talking about having a bad day uh, and snapping at your spouse or, or at anyone or having an excellent day when you receive the raise at the office. We are talking about lasting deep changes that permeates our hearts, our heads and our way of living. They are all undeniable connected and they are revealed each day through everything we say and do. We will see that this person, definitely, his life has changed. Often as people of God, we like to believe that what matters most is the amount of faith we feel in our spirit. But John says clearly to those around him, what you do or do, don't do matters. Everything that comes out of your mouth matters. That is what John is saying. So Jesus would say something similar later also to his disciples. That is, is, isn't what goes in that defiles, but what comes out of our mouth originating in the heart that reveals the nature of the spirit. For our actions to change, our hearts must first change. There are two things. For us to have good actions, which shows that we have changed, it starts with the heart. If our hearts are changed, the way we live will follow. And the only God can change our hearts. No one can change our hearts besides God. Be fruits, words of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. What a statement. So John the Baptist was really the last of the prophets. He had an amazing ministry and preached with fire. What did he preach and send for? In fact, he urged the people not to try to ride into heaven on Abraham's shoulders, but rather to face honestly the question and to stand on their own feet and make up their own minds. He's saying, don't claim that you are Abraham's children, Abraham's descendants. You need to have your own faith. That is what he's saying. As in our day, so, and so his, there were far too many people who relied on their parents or forefathers rather than assuming their own spiritual responsibility. To, uh, to say, okay, because I'm a minister's child, I'm a pastor's child, I'm an evangelist's child, uh, my father are uh, the deacons, my fathers are, uh, my parents are uh, serving in the church, it doesn't help you. It doesn't save you. Men of John's hearers were shocked when he said that being Abraham's descendants was not enough for God. So the religious leaders relied more on their family lines than on their faith or their standing with God. 
For them, religion was inherited. You inherit from your parents. But a personal relationship with God is not handed down from parents to children. No. It's your relationship with God. You alone. Everyone is to commit to it on his or her own terms. Don't rely on someone's life's faith for your salvation. If you profess to have a life renewed and changed by Jesus, then make sure your actions truly show it. It's not about your parents that they've been church members. It's not about your, 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 your relatives that they've been church members. When John begins to baptize people on the shores of Jordan, his baptism is one of repentance, a commitment to lasting change, a commitment to allow God to mold and change the inner composition of our hearts so that everything we do reveals the nature of that change. So John's proclamation is a call to action to live out the faith we claim to have by truly letting God in determine the kind of fruit that will emerge through our life, our acts. Our face to the world reveals the germination happening in our hearts, minds, and spirits. We know people by their fruits, their lives. God is no use for people who call themselves Christians but do nothing about it. When you call yourself a Christian, you need to show through that bear repentance. Like many in John's day, who were God's people in name only. People are of no value if they are Christians in name only. They are of no value. If others can't see someone's faith in the way that person treats them, he or she may not be God's person at all. So how are believers to hear good fruit? How are believers to bear good fruit? God calls them to be active in their obedience. To be productive for God's means, obeying his teaching, resisting temptation, actively serving others and sharing their faith. That's the only way. You are active, an active participant in the kingdom of God. You are working towards something you are resisting temptation. You are obeying his teaching. You are saying, I need to actively save others and not only myself. That's what it is. So John knows that we cannot figure all of this out of our own. We need God's help, our creator's breath, in order to undergo true and lasting change. But he also knows that we too must commit the process and commit to nurturing and cultivating the seeds of love and kindness planted within us. These are the things we have now. In John's sermon, disturbed the people and they began to ask serious questions. What shall we do? That was the question. What shall we do? They queried. In the reply, John laid down his moral teachings. The first one, he said, concerns come from a group of affluent people, somewhat conscience-stricken because of their wealth. What shall we do? They ask it. Share your substance. John replies. If you have two coats, give one to a neighbor who is in need. Share your excess, whether it's food or clothing. Isn't that great? On verse 11. The person with two tannins ought to share with anyone who has none. The same with extra food so that no one is hungry. Then the second delegation was the businessman. Their question was similar to the first teacher. What shall we do? To them, John replied, exert no more than is appropriate. Be honest and fair. On verse 12. Then the third group was the military. It is interesting to note that John had in all three of these groups in his audience. In the response to their parallel question, John responded with, do violence to no one. Be content. Neither accuse anyone falsely. Do your neighbor no harm. On verse 14. So, what should we do as Christians? What should we do? John Smith demands at least three specific responses. The first one, share what you have with those who need. That is what he's saying. Number two, whatever your job is, do it well with fairness. Number three, be content with what you are earning in your life. So John had no time to give comforting messages to those who lived careless life or selfish lives. He was calling the people to right living. What changes 
can you make in sharing what you have? Doing your work honestly and well and being content. What changes need to happen in your life? Then John ends the warning. I baptize with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will clear his threshing stone to descend the hearts of men. Jesus' baptism will be a discernment of the heart committed to God. He descends the heart. He sees what you are doing. You know, when you are having chest problems, sometimes you go to the hospital and sometimes they will take x-ray to see what is happening in your life, in your chest. But I want to tell you, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is able to discern what is going on in your heart. He has got a spiritual x-ray that sees what me, that you, and others cannot see, but only Jesus can see it. He's able to see it. So the threshing stone is an amazing metaphor in the scripture. It was a round, flat clearing of land, usually on a hill, designed for separating grain from chaff, the lightweight husk that surrounds the grain. So using a winnowing fork, a kind of large cross between a, a pitchfork and a plow, the farmer would draw it across the pile of grain. In doing so, the empty husk would fly away into the wind. The heavier and nutrient-rich grain would be left on the threshing floor and gathered into beans. Since early biblical days, the threshing floor has been used as a kind of court or a judging place for those accused of a crime. So the threshing floor was also used as a place of decision-making for a tribe, something like a town meeting. So whenever you hear about the threshing floor, you hear something where people would gather there. In the story of Ruth, Ruth is received as Boaz's wife on the threshing floor. Where a good spirit is discerned, the threshing floor is a place of discernment in which Jesus can determine the nature of our hearts. He is able to see the nature of a Christian heart from somebody who is not a committed Christian. One might be able to dupe some by acting as a good person occasionally when convenience strikes, but if inside that person's heart is still disconnected from God, Jesus will be able to tell. He is the only one who is able to tell. You may fake other people, but you can't fake Jesus Christ. You will never fake the Holy Spirit. If one claims to love God and worship Jesus, but keeps his or a life closed off from others, Jesus will be able to tell. He is able to tell if your life is closed off from others. In a sense, the threshing floor is Jesus' artistic canvas. You may enter in disguise, but you exit with a face that reveals that the inner working of your heart. What kind of face reveals your heart? Are you downcast? Whenever something is happening in your life, we can see through your face that something is not good. Because the face reveals what is right in your heart. You may pretend, but you can't pretend for a long time. The face reveals what is down in your heart. Today, our faces may not look like tomatoes or kiwis or oranges, but they may look like bags of money, clothes and jewelry, bank statements or technology, because that is what we have in our homes. They, 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 they portray what we have in our homes. Our faces, God, the great artists of life, will look like the idols we worship most. If I walk right out there and show that, okay, I have a lot of money, that's what is revealed on my face. It doesn't reveal that you've got Jesus in your heart. It doesn't reveal that you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart. It reveals what you have, the idols that you worship. So John's proclamation before Jesus' appearance is a wake-up call to all people. It is still a wake-up call for us today, not to be a consumer of things, Stuff claiming to love God but putting our attention on things and our needs. It's a call for us to allow God to change our hearts into cultivators of love, kindness, respect, and goodness. We are being called towards Christmas. He is telling people to say, Give what you can. If you have got what you if you have got a lot of things, give to others. Give to others those who do not have. You may know of other people who are struggling right now within your own community, but you have got the capacity, you have got the ability 
to meet all their needs. Why don't you go and share with them? Why don't you call them for dinner and share with them this Christmas? In the Garden of Eden, humankind was given a vocation by God to till and keep the garden, to cultivate and nourish our relationship with God and to bear the fruit of that relationship to others throughout all generations. We are to nurture the God-given kindness and love in our hearts so that the fruit we bear to the world looks beautiful, loving, kind, giving to God and to others. That is what we are asking to do, to give what is good to others. Think about your friends. Think about anyone you walk across, what they're experiencing. Christianity is all about relationship. Our relationship with God, with ourselves, with the world and with others. If you cannot find a good relationship with other people, then you are not serving Christ. You are serving other things. There is a relationship with Christ. There is a relationship with other people. What does those relations look like when we cultivate the presence of God in our hearts and lives? People will see, perhaps like a beautiful garden, and perhaps like the face of Jesus. People will be able to see the face of Jesus in you. Because you are cultivating that relationship into your life. You are cultivating that relationship in your life and people will be able to see Christ. Do you see that face of Jesus in the faces of your neighbors and friends? When you meet others, do you see the face of Jesus? Will they see Jesus' face in yours? That is the question. And I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, may your face to the world be as beautiful as God has gifted to you. And may God's gift of love to you in the birth of Jesus Christ, child, resonate your heart and be revealed in your soul now and always. People need to see Christ. When we say Christ is born, we are saying, is Christ born in your life? Is Christ born in your heart? Can people see Christ, the new baby in you? Can they see Christ, the way you talk, the way you live, everything? You, we interact with the people from different types of folks. Are they able, after the end of our service, able to say, thank you, I've seen Christ in this man. I've seen Christ in this person. May God bless you as you continue to show who Christ is to others in your life. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the love you have shown to us. We thank you that sometimes we, 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 we forget who we are. But you are always there for us. So we praise you for the gift of witness to your love. We give thanks for the witness of John the Baptist and his message to the people and his relevance for us today. We give you thanks for the ordinary everyday life that witness to you the power and glory. We give thanks that you are always surprising us and meeting us right where we are. We give thanks for you right in our times of darkness, for your hand in times of loneliness, for your leading in times of uncertainty. To you, our true God, we offer our praise and thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you. We thank you for everything. For all who feel the weight of illness and pain and of death and dying, for those impacted by COVID-19 in all its forms and those who treat treatment for other conditions, they have been sidelined or best delayed. For those who have no they have to prioritize and even choose who was, is what they care for. For care deliverers and providers pushed into crisis by COVID-19. Father, we pray for these people. We pray that there are other people who are going to celebrate Christmas on their own without able to meet with their family relatives because of this pandemic. But Father, we pray that you are in control. Bless us, Father, in your name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I would urge you again to 
think upon what God has been doing to your life. And when we look closely, we find that we've got only maybe a few weeks before the end of the year. And we need to thank God for that. That God has managed to take care of us and he helped us to be where we are through 221. And I'm saying it is high time you think of thanking God for what God has done to you. Just sending his son to us is really a great thing. Let us pray for the offerings. As you take your offering before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we bring our offering to you. We thank you for everything. May you be able to bless us, to bless every one of us, those who have managed to give their thanksgiving offering, those who have managed to remember that everything that we have comes from you. So we are bringing back the gifts that you have given us. May this offering which we bring before you be also not noted by you. Bless this offering, Father. Bless everyone who has managed to just say thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we still say, help us go into the world in peace to be of good courage, to hold fast to what, that which is good, to strengthen the faith uttered, to support the weak, to honor everyone, to love and save God. Be with us and among us and remain with us always. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.